The government here wrestles with major welfare reforms. The public backlash against Britain's benefit system and its soaring bill is growing by the day. An official report just out reveals that more than half of British adults believe the current welfare system is too generous. And this week, the first of radical new changes there have seen hundreds of thousands of people who have applied for an unemployment benefit told that they're capable of working. The move back to work has been driven by top-ranking Cabinet Minister Ian Duncan-Smith, who's been here this week to share his experiences. Narelle Susted asked him about the impact of long-term benefit dependency on people and communities. That uh, is a real problem because it does two things. First of all, they're not available to the workforce. It means you have to bring in people from overseas for low-skilled jobs. And the second thing is there's no kindness to park somebody out of work, uh, you know, at the first moment they enter work as a young kid. Uh, they lose all their aspiration and hope and then they become difficult and quite often it's from those communities you draw your highest cost of health because some of the sickest areas in Britain are the ones that are actually the most unemployed. And then also a tiny minority in those groups then end up getting into criminal behaviour and criminal activity and the you know, advent of street gangs in the UK, violent criminal, drug dealing, drug taking, sort of organisations made up of young kids between about the age of 11 and 22. So these things all spring from this idea that, that people in those communities have no hope, no aspiration and no thought that they can take control of their lives. So the costs are enormous to us, but the social costs are even bigger. Uh, and it's those that we have to rectify, and that's really the great medium-term plan that I'm trying to bring forward. Do you think that that's one of the shifts that's happening here in the way that we're thinking about welfare? Is it's going from being seen as something that's purely fiscal to something that's being acknowledged as being a bit wider? There's social impact. Yes, I've been struck actually while I'm here in New Zealand as to the nature of the debate. Uh, I think the debate in the UK has moved on a long way. Um, uh, it isn't just about, you know, can we afford this, should we cut it, should we not, and it seems to me the debate here, if you don't mind me saying so, is a little bit two-dimensional. You know, on the one hand, people protesting because you might take a bit of money away, on the other hand, people saying we can't afford that, so we have to take some money away. But in actual fact, you know, you need to get back to the roots of welfare. Why do we have welfare? We have welfare because we believe in a decent society uh, that people who, for whatever reason, uh, fall out of the normal processes of life, work, you know, constructing families, building communities, it doesn't go right for them. They need support in their time of need. That's what welfare is all about. But welfare should be one more thing than that. It should be about then helping them change uh, their lives so they take control of their lives, helping them rebuild, get them out of that process and back into mainstream society. It's that bit which has gone completely missing from welfare systems around the world. Do you think that we've reached the end of a post-war consensus on welfare being something that the state should provide? If the consensus was that government did everything, uh, then yes, that, that will have been broken, and quite rightly too, and I hope it stays broken. The key thing is now, the new story here is, how do you bring the whole of the community, and each community, to affect change in their communities, life change for those communities? No longer do we dole out uh, sort of top-down prescriptions to people as though they were children. We start treating people like adults and saying to them, look, you know, you must now take control of your lives. We're going to help by getting people near you to help you. How you do that depends on what kind of a person you are and what kind of community you live in. But at the end of the day, getting work in your household, taking control of your life, having the money to manage your life, these are very important things so your children can achieve the sort of aspirations that they might hope for that my children would want and not get written off, which is what's been happening too much in the past. Is that something that you think is changing throughout Western countries? I don't know. Um, it's interesting that, as I say, the nature of debate here is slightly different from that in the UK and I would suspect certainly different from that in America. But I think the general sense now growing is that what's happened over the last 20 or 30 years is that in the pursuit of uh, pure economic issues, that is to say growth above everything else, you know, the rising tide will rise all the ships, we often forgot that actually there are some ships with deep holes in them and what you've got to try and do is mend the holes. Otherwise, the ships don't rise. Which of the proposals from the Centre for Social Justice, which you founded, have you taken on board? And what we've taken to the department that I run uh, essentially is a way of changing the benefit system and the work programme. So, number one is I'm uh, engaged in a big, big change to bring all of those back to work benefits merged to one rather than seven or eight. The second area that I'm dealing with is a thing called the work programme, where we're actually saying for those who are most difficult to get to work, and bearing in mind 
90% of all adults are back in work in the UK within a year, 75% within six months. So you want to look at the 10% of the adults that don't, who have difficulties and problems. So you need to say to the voluntary sector and the private sector, look, we can't help them, so what we need is real experts to come in and work things through their life. And then get them into work and they'll be rewarded on what's called a pay by results system so as they get them to work they trigger a payment but more importantly and this is the thing which is different from anything that's gone before in our country is I'm saying but getting them back to work isn't the be-all end-all the key thing for these sort of people particularly young kids who have never held a job before or come from families where no one's held a job so they have no work experience is to get them into work and then sustain them in work and by doing that you need to be mentored properly supported by people who are in work so that if you have a problem you can go to them you can't go to your parents if they've never held a job, but you can go to your mentor. And so you get trigger other payments for being in work for six months, you know, nine months, a year, maybe a year and a half, depending on the categories of individuals. And your payments actually get bigger further on down the line. And for those who are most difficult of those categories to place, you get more money. What has the public reception been to the reforms that you're trying to push through at the moment? Actually, remarkably positive. Uh, welfare reform in the UK scores, you know, sort of 60, 70 percent uh, average positive uh, rating because people know that over the years they've realised this has got out of hand now. What's happened is that there are far too many people who are permanently out of work. I mean, the fact that we have a fifth of all households in the UK don't have any work at all, I mean, it's really awful. And uh, for those who scream about, ooh, you mustn't change any of this, it's all about money. I, I simply say to them, you know, you need to wake up and smell the coffee here. I mean, you can only say that because you're not part of that. You know, if you lived a life like that, boy, would you be screaming something different. Are there enough jobs, though? Yeah, I mean, I hear this argument all the time, there aren't enough jobs. Actually, in the UK, over the last uh, year, we've created, uh, private sector's created about half a million new jobs. Uh, so there are new jobs being created. Um, it's a, a rotating workforce, you know, people are in and out of work, people are actually taking on new work. Uh, so yes, I think, uh, and as the economy grows more, so there will be more jobs. I mean, one of the problems was in the last decade under the last government, they created somewhere between two and three million new jobs, but actually we had four and a half million people sitting permanently unemployed. And the reason is that 60% plus of those jobs went to foreign nationals, because British companies no longer employed you know, young British kids had given up on them. And it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for the children, young people. It's a tragedy for the companies too, because they are, you know, part of the British fabric and they do owe it to British people to try and find labour from Britain. Now, I just want to change tact a little bit here and ask what impact the news of the world scandals had on the political process in the UK? Uh, so far, it's basically forced politicians to uh, ask themselves the question which perhaps we should have been asking a long time before, had we got too close to the people that run uh, the newspapers? And in a sense, probably the answer to that is yes, uh, but it was for all parties, I think. Um, but more particularly, I think the bigger question, so we need to investigate that, we need to sort it out, there'll be an inquiry about that, how do we sort this out? The second question really is, to what degree do we need some kind of control on newspapers? Now, I am absolutely against the state controlling the media. Absolutely. I, I, it's an abomination to me because a free media is necessary, even when they're pretty awful and criticising me, I still believe it's the right thing you know, on the balance. Uh, but we do need some kind of mechanism because the present Press Complaints Authority, which is a sort of thing set up by the press, doesn't really work. It's been pretty toothless. So I think some kind of independent body, but independence the word, that does and is able uh, to hold papers to account. And the third area, which I think is a real concern, probably bigger than the politician side of it, is the police that the police have got far too close to, to journalists um, and the selling of stories, the selling of information I think is utterly out of order. Has it damaged the government? Actually there hasn't been damage to the government because I think this is a sort of plague on all your houses attitude from the public because they sort of thought we generally got up to this in the past. Uh, the Millie Dowler, you know, the murdered girl, that was shocking uh, and that meant that we have to change this now. So the complacency was changed by that and the public was appalled by it. Uh, so we have to act on it. Um, but I don't think this is an issue that changes public opinion about politics or politicians because I think it's pretty much confirmed their own view of them at the same time. So I think from that standpoint it doesn't change things. But it does change things in terms of the public's determination. We will root out this and make a difference. That was Britain's Work and Pension Secretary Ian Duncan-Smith talking to Narelle Su uh, Susted.